screen. My name is Charles Healy, and I, as I've been introduced by Miss Alessio, I am a direct descendant of the last ranching family on San Rosa Island. And this presentation is in conjunction with my latest publication, San Rosa Island, a photographic panorama, which was published in December. And so let me share my screen. Okay. And so I decided to call this presentation Santa Rosa Island a historical panorama because in this presentation I wanted to cover the chronological history of Santa Rosa Island while my book covers a visual history of what you would have seen and would see today if you went to the island. So I wanted to switch it up. And this picture that I used in the background is actually the picture used on the cover of my book. This is Betcher's Bay. This is the side of the island that you could see from the mainland on a very clear day. And as we learn more, as we go through this presentation, here is the main ranch, there's the barns. This is the Vaquero too, which you will learn soon throughout this presentation and the pier and the Torrey Pines are over there. So let's begin. So Santa Rosa Island is the second largest of the California Channel Islands. It is 84 square miles or also 54,000 acres. It is only smaller of, the, of another island, which is Santa Cruz Island, which is to the right side of it, which is what you really see from the mainland. That's about 62,000 acres. The highest peak is Vail Peak, which is 1,589 feet from sea level, and it is 26.5 miles off the coast of the nearest point of mainland, which is about Isla Vista, which if you don't know, that is where UCSB is. And it's about 33 miles from Santa Barbara. And what people might not know is Santa Rosa is not flat. It's very varied in topography, very steep. Um, there's a few areas, if you can see my mouse, this area right here, which we called Carrington Pasture, which is relatively flat. We call this the pocket field because it was one of the few areas of true even ground. And, well, and the rest of the land is quite varied, quite steep. Over here, we have the Lepis, which is the steepest area. Um, some areas, it's like a sharp cliff with only just a deer trail to walk through. And other places, there's large beaches like Skunk Point, which is named after the skunk, the spotted skunk, which is native. But everything else is quite steep and hilly. So before the ranch. So thousands before, thousands of years before the ranch, the island had a large inhabitants, which were the pygmy mammoths. They lived on the island for thousands of years and went, went extinct only 12,000 years ago. They inhabited Santa Rosa Island, San Miguel, and San Cruz, Santa Cruz Island. And the theory is that when the land masses of the islands and the mainland, Santa Barbara was closer, they are thought to have swam to the island and then throughout generations of breeding then became small to what we know what they are. And as I said, they went extinct about 12,000 years ago. And this picture, I think my grandfather took this picture. This is quite a discovery because before this time, which is 1994, what you would find from a pygmy mammoth was fragments. You'd find maybe a leg, you'd find a jaw, you'd find a molar. And this discovery in 1994, which is over by Carrington Point was huge because not a, a full skeleton of the pygmy mammoth was ever found. And so this was a real discovery. And I think it might be this one or it might be another full skeleton of a, of a mammoth that was found. But one of those two is actually in the Santa Barbara Natural History Museum. And fun fact, I think this is the skeleton that my dog or my parents' dog Toots ran over because when they were unearthing this, my parents went over to see and for some reason, Toots must have saw something and ran right over it, and all the archaeologists start going into a panic, but no damage. And then about um, 12,000 years ago, the ancestors of the Chumash came to the island through the theory of the Bering Strait Bridge or the Kelp Highway. And the Chumash lived on Santa Rosa Island from about 13 to 12,000 years ago to about the last time they Last Chumash left the island, which was in 1817. 
The Chumash called Sanrisa Island Wima, pronounced Wima, not Wima, which means redwood because as you can see with my mouse, there's, mouse, there is a beach right here called Soledad Beach. And what's special about it is that the currents of the Pacific Ocean somehow wash everything ashore right here. So if you go there, you'll find driftwood, you'll find messages in a bottle, you'll find glass, these big glass balls that fishermen across the Pacific would use for their fishing nets. You'll find anything on Soledad. And the last time I was there, which was in 2017, this beach particularly, there were three redwood logs about, I don't know, at least 50 feet long. And that's why the Chumash called the island Wima because a lot of driftwood from Northern California and from Oregon, large redwood logs would fall into the ocean and they would be swept from the currents onto this beach and then, oops, sorry. And from there, the Chumash would then use that redwood, cut it into planks and then make their tumuls, which is their canoes. And for fun fact, this, um, this village right here, Helawashkui, which is near um, East Point and South Point, and this is La Jolla right here, Helawashkui is roughly translated to something in the middle of two other things, which is most likely in reference to San Rosa being in between San Miguel, which is Token, and Santa Cruz, which is known as Limu. And then in 1542, Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo was the first European to discover California and the Channel Islands. He discovered the Santa Barbara Channel Channel Islands in 1542 as well. And he is known to have stopped at San Miguel and he was known also to stop at Santa Rosa too. He passed away in, in 1543 and supposedly, no one knows, but it's a rumor. He's either buried on San Miguel or Santa Rosa, but I don't know how you would find that. It's been hundreds of years since he died. And he was the last Spanish person to see Santa, Santa Barbara and the Channel Islands until 1769 when the Portola expedition with Gaspar Portola and then Junipero Serra came through California to discover mainland California and also to reintegrate the coastal, the coastal transportation of the Spanish. And it was 1769 that true Spanish influence was starting to be affected on the island, mainly because of the Chumash would be, would be taken to the mission system. And slowly from the 1780s, I think our mission, Mission Santa Barbara was built in 1784. From that time to about 1817, the Chumash from Santa Rosa and also the other channel, other, other channel islands slowly left to, to go to the mission, whether for spiritual needs or most likely for food and water and shelter. Well, it is known that in 1815 and 1817, the last Chumash left Santa Rosa Island. They, had a, they were in these villages right over here. 1815, a large earthquake, which was centered underneath Santa Rosa Island, uh, went, you know, it, there was an earthquake and it was so large that canyons were formed, gullies were formed and rocks were cracked. Well, so many Chumash were freaked out. They thought the world was ending. So they left for the mission for spiritual safety. And then in 1817, the last known Chumash left Santa Rosa Island when a large El Nino storm came disrupting their marine food sources and they had to leave because of starvation. And even before the ranch even began, people were also using Santa Rosa other, other than the Chumash. In 1821, Mexico, including California and Channel Islands, won its independence from Spain. And a decade before Santa Rosa Island was a ranch, it and the surrounding islands were used as sea otters because back in the day before they became extinct in their area, there was a lot of sea otters, especially in Fetcher's Bay, once again, the area of the island that faces Santa Barbara and what you see. And the well-known local frontiersman, George Nineover, the Tennessee-born fur trapper and frontiersman who came to California in 1830, 1834 with the Walker Party, when he inhabited, when he came to California and moved to Santa Barbara, he used San Rosa Island as a sea otter base and he would come fish or hunt sea otters in Betcher's Bay. And he came out here about 1835, 1836, multiple trips. And it was that same time the Russians were coming to the Channel Islands too. And they had contracted with Aleut Indians from Alaska and they were coming at the same time to also 
harvest these sea otters. And at one time, it is known that George Nightover and Alu, Alu Indians that were left on Santa Rosa Island by Russian fur trappers, they got into a shootout where the main ranch is today. And George Nightover had to camp out and use this cave called Centaro's Cave, which is right here in a canyon behind the main ranch. And he had to use that to, sh to shelter himself from the enemy's bullets. No one knows what happened to those Aleut Indians, but George Nightover did go on and live, as we know, and went on in 1853 to bring Juana Juan Maria, or the lone woman of San Nicolas de Santa Barbara, and fun fact, he also homesteaded San Miguel Island, the neighboring island. And from 1836 to 1843, the island was not used again. Nightover stopped using it for sea hunting after, sea otter hunting after that time. And then Rancho Isla Santa Rosa. It's technically known as Rancho Santa Rosa, but there is tech, but there is another rancho which was established as a land grant in Santa Barbara County called Santa Rosa, Rancho Santa Rosa in Santa Barbara County. So I just called it Rancho Isla Santa Rosa, so there's no historical confusion. In 1843, Manuel Mitchell Terrania, the ninth governor of Alta California, granted Santa Rosa Island to Don Carlos Carrillo and Jose Antonio Carrillo, the sons of Jose Ramundo Carrillo, who came to California during the Porla expedition in 1769 and was and their father was a grantee of Ranch in Nuestra Sonora del Refugio, which is where Refugio Beach is today. They were granted this island in 1843, but right afterwards they gave it the two brothers then granted the island to one two of Don Carlos's um, daughters, Maria Francesca Carrillo and Manuel Antonia Carrillo. And then a month after receiving the island, those two girls then gave it to their American English husbands who came to California as seafaring merchants in the 1820s. Their names were Alpha Davis Basil Thompson and John Coffin Jones. Alpha Davis married Maria Francesca Carrillo Thompson and Mr. Jones married Manuel Antonia Carrillo. Oh, sorry. Maria Francesca Carrillo Thompson and Manuel Anto Antonia Carrillo Jones. And Thomas and Jones created a main ranch at the old ranch, and that is what it was. That, that's what it was. No, it is known today because the main ranch is over here, at Butcher's, at Butcher's Bay, and so we call this old ranch because that was where the Creo Ranch was. The two men created the old, their main ranch in eight, in 1844 by creating a ranch complex. Um, a small barn, a small redwood house and corrals, and a pier that came off of East Beach right here. And in 1844, 1844 the men brought 270 head of cattle, nine head of horses, and 53 head of sheep, all owned by Don Carlos Carrillo, and they had Don Carlos Carrillo's rocking horse brand. And I wanted to include these pictures from my book. They are from my book, and they are from the 90s, but I just wanted to give you an idea where the Carrillo Ranch was. So this is um, a mare that we had named Mom, and this is Sam, but right here was where that redwood little house was. The corrals were right here, and over here is where that old pier used to be. And when my Uncle Bill was working on the island in the 1950s, he remembers seeing the old wood pilings in the beach and in the shallows of the water, which are the remnants of the legs from the pier. And then this is another picture of the of the old ranch. This is cattle, this is the marsh, and the pier was right here in corrals as well. Those, I think, got, um, I think those were deconstructed in about the 1880s, but as I told you in the 1950s, the pilings at the pier were still seen. And then in 1858, Thompson and Jones, or really the Carrillos, then sold the island to the Moors. And what happened is that in 1847, Jones decided to move this family to Boston for more business deals and for more business connections. And he left all close in head management to Thompson. Well, as a partnership, which they were still were, if Thompson was ever going to make business deals like buy or sell cow or do anything to the island, he needed to give or ask permission from Jones, since they were partners. Well, a couple of years after Jones and his family moved to Boston in 1847, Thompson sold a large amount of cattle to some buyer without permission. Jones then figured out in about 1851 
they went to court against each other and the court ruled that Jones was right, that Thompson did not give or ask permission for Jones and he needed to give a share of the money to Jones. Well, then Thompson then said that Jones must have bought out the witnesses or the jury. And so he, he appealed and in that appellate court in 18, 1857 ruled with the previous ruling, which was Thompson did wrong and he had to share the money and he shouldn't have sold that cattle without Jones. Well, since the friendship and the partnership were in tatters now, since both men couldn't trust each other, they started selling shares to the Moore brothers, Henry H. Moore, Alexander P. Moore, and Thomas Moore. They were wealthy California American ranchers. And if you don't know, Moore Mesa, which is near Hope Ranch in Santa Barbara, is named after them. And then in 1859, they had bought all the shares of the Carrillos or of Thompson Jones, and the island was now secure in Moore ownership. In 1858, Alexander Peter Moore, which is the brother who had the more, most say and then became sole owner, sole owner soon, built the big house, which this is a picture from my book. This is a house that is still standing today. And I remember being, it has such a steep staircase. He built this in 1858 and is reportedly to be the oldest wood frame house in Santa Barbara County. And before there used to be a lot of Monterey cypresses that used to surround it, now there's just a couple. Well, by 1881, Alexander P. Moore was sole owner of San Rosa Island. He bought out the shares of Thomas Moore in the 1860s and, is believe, and it is believed that Henry passed away in 1881, le leaving Alexander to be sole owner. And Alexander and his brothers turned the ranch into a sheep ranch was because before Thompson Jones had the island as a cattle ranch with at least 8,000 head of cattle, 300 horses and 2,000 head of sheep. And the Moors then made the island primarily into a sheep ranch. In 1870, Moore then moved the main ranch from the old ranch of the East Beach to where we see it today near Betcher's Bay and what we see today. And I included these pictures because all of these structures are still standing. This is the saddle barn with which stored um, hay and horse tack saddles and um, tools. This was the blacksmith barn which had tools and welding material and a butcher, butcher room. And then this is the scale shed which is where livestock were weighed. And I also wanted to include this picture also from my book which also shows the chute shed next to the scale shed is where, where cattle were put in, are put into a chute and processed upon. So he moved the main ranch in 1870 by building these structures. And at one time in the 1880s, Alexander Peter Moore had turned the island into the largest sheep ranch in America at that time, and probably still in American history, because at one time he had 80,000 to 100,000 head of sheep producing 415,000 pounds of wool a year. And this, I want to include, this is the inside of the saddle barn. This is, this picture's from the 90s. And this is um, where horses would be if you want to shoe them with, with horseshoes or put saddles on. And this is a hay manger. This is where the saddles were stored. This is a little upstairs section where there was a continuation of the tack room. And then this room over here is where the hayloft was. And in this picture, this is the original, oops, this is the original scale that was in the scale shed. It's actually right next to me in my father's office. And this was the scale that was in the scale shed where the cattle were weighed upon. And this was built in 1870, patented in 1856 and 1859 by Howe. And as you can see, there's um, my Uncle Bill and then Uncle Al weighing cattle. And what would happen is that there was this pen in the shed and the, and the pen was on this scale. Well, when you put a certain amount of cattle on that scale, which was normally five, this bar would then go out of balance. It, it would lean this way or lean that way. And then from there, you then had to use these weights onto this hook and then somehow balance the weight along with these. And then you would make it even again. And from there, you would do some complex mathematical calculation where then you would get the average of the weight. And I'm happy that we don't have to do that anymore because cattle scales are now elect electronic. And so when they stand on them now, the weight just comes up. So I thank God every day for that. I don't have to 
deal with that. I've asked my parents, do you remember how, how to do this? My mom never knew. My dad says, I can't remember. And why would you? Because it was so complex. But you had to do it in the 1870s and the Valen Vickers and my family had to do it throughout the 1900s. And in the 1880s, A.P. Moore extended the main ranch. He, he built the original bunkhouse, a cute white cottage, which is where my grandparents' family lived. And he built the original pier. And this is not the original pier because the original pier was destroyed in a storm in 1885, replaced, that was destroyed in another storm in 1900. And then this pier was built. And then this was kept until 2010, of course, battered by waves and storms and the barrier fences would fall off. And then now we, the park service has a new pier, which they built in 2010. It's nice and concrete, very fancy. Along with the bunkhouse and this pier, he also had these gum trees planted, which acted as windbreakers and also a potential source of wood to repair the pier. Well, over the years, because of all the wind, the gum trees became warped and they became unusable because they were all crooked and twisted. And A.P. Moore also built a dairy cow barn, which sat over here, and then that was demolished in the 1950s. And in 1893, Alexander Peter Moore passed away, leaving the island to many, many family members because he had no children of his own. I think he was married twice, but he had no children. And the island was left to a living brother of his, as well as 10 nephews and nieces, a lot. Well, without a concise leadership, the island then became in disarray. The island was not being kept up. The livestock were not in good condition. And in 1895, California Supreme Court appointed examiner came to the island and basically saw that the sheep were not producing the wool they should have been and were scabby. The cattle were wild. The horse, most horses were not usable because it became so wild. And Oh, and after that, the Moors then decided to sell the island to Vale and Vickers in 1901 because their time in the island was done and they just wanted to move on and the management had become, had become so bad. And so this is the Vale and Vickers era, 1901 to 2011, and then my family's era, 1910 to 2020. And I love this picture. I just discovered it really recently. And this picture was taken in 1901 the, either the day or a few days after Vale and Vickers bought the island or purchased the island from the Moors. And as you can see, this is a great view of the saddle barn from the other side, still looks the same. This right here is quite cool. You could drive tractors and trucks in. And my uncle Bill in the 50s actually con constructed a grease pit where you could climb under the vehicles and repair them. This is the blacksmith barn and this is before half of the side was demolished. And before it was completely enclosed, like a double A frame. And inside, like I said, was the repair shop and the welder, welding shop and the anvils and the butcher shop. But there were also these rendering kettles, which the Moors built in the 1880s to render sheep carcasses for lard and tallow. And I think in about the 20s, this side was demolished and then the barn was then left as a single A-frame and then these rendering kettles are now exposed and they're still there. This is the outhouse, which is still there, but I advise you not to go in it because there's just weeds and poison oak and not a great situation. And then this is an old butcher shed. This is where pigs were kept and this is an old butcher and smoke sh shed. And then the bunkhouse, the original bunkhouse and the new bunkhouse, which is built in 1869, is right over here. And then this is the dairy cow barn, which is not there anymore. It was demolished in the 50s and a house called the Foreman's house, but I call it Uncle Bill's house was built in the early 60s. And then the gum trees are over here, but they're too short. And actually over here is Santa Cruz Island. So like I said, in 1901, Valen Vickers bought Santa Rosa Island from the Moors. It was, and that company was comprised of Walter Lennoxville and John Von Vickers. They were, very wealthy and very powerful cattlemen from Arizona. Walter was, he owned and leased millions of acres. His, his ranch in Arizona called the Empire Ranch, that was his main ranch, at one point was over a million acres. And throughout California, he leased and owned millions of acres. Temecula, which is down south, at one point was a ranch that he owned and 
And I think in the 1890s, he decided to lease the San Fernand, the whole San Fernando Valley for fun. And John von Vickers, he was also, also a wealthy cattleman himself. He owned a lot of property in Texas as well. Um, over the time from 1901 to 2011, which is the time of Vale and Vickers ownership and leash, leasemanship, um, the Vales were very hands-on with the ranch, while the Vickers, um, starting with John Vaughn and, th and throughout his descendants, were silent partners. They trusted the Vales and they trusted, you know, my family when they were out there too. And they were silent partners. They just invested. And occasionally they would go out there for hunts or vacation, but they were silent. It was really with the Vale family, starting with Walter Vale, that the Vales were more hands-on. They ran the cattle, they sold the cattle, they ran the ranch, and they managed everything. And the and the Vale turned the cattle ranch turned San Rose Island back into a cattle ranch. He sold off everything that was wild, including cattle horse and cattle and horses, replaced them with cattle that he wanted and horses that he knew were broke. And he turned the island to a very successful ranch, but he never got to see the full potential because in 1906, when he was in Los Angeles, he died in a streetcar accident. Actually, in the 1890s, he moved the company office from Arizona to Los Angeles. And it was in 1906 when he was helping his wife get out of a streetcar in Los Angeles is when he was crushed by two and then slowly died a few days later from his injuries. And when he died, his eldest son, Nathan Russell Vale, took over the management and had it until he passed away in 1943. And he was a good manager too. He commissioned the Vicaro One, which you can see right here is, you could say the first cattle boat. There were boats before. Um, the Moors had built a schooner and the Vales built a schooner in 1903, but those were quite smaller. This was very professional, it was quite large. And from this section all the way over here was just pens for cattle. There were cabins up here and supplies up here. And it was also during NR's Vale's time that he supplied uh, more elk and deer to the island, but we'll get to that later. And this is the time when my family enters the scene. Uh, my family first came to the island in 1910 through my great-grandfather, Charles Wesley Smith. And I want to give a backstory to him. He was born in 1869. He was a Seneca Indian orphan. At the age of a few months, he was put into an orphanage in Queens, New York. Well, he ran away in, at the age of 13 years, made it to Louisiana. He got a job as a cabin boy there. And from 1883, when he was 13 to 1890, he sailed around the world working on cargo ships and earned his captain's certificate at that time. And in 1888, he took a break from the sailing and was a powder monkey for the Pikes, Peach, Pikes Peak Carriage Road construction in Colorado. And it was in 1890, he was on a schooner called Nelly when he decided to change his life and he stopped at Catalina Island where when the, when the Nelly um, ported there. And it was at that same time that Walter Vale was leasing Catalina Island for stalker cattle, which is beef cattle. And I don't know how these two met. They must have met at a bar in Avalon, but they immediately struck up a great friendship. And Walter asked my great grandfather, CW, would you like to come work for me at my ranch, the Empire in Arizona? And CW says yes. And from 1890 to 1914, he works on the Empire. He works his way up from cow puncher until he is cattle boss of the Empire. He's um, head shipper of cattle from Arizona to. Kansas, and he also owned his own ranch neighboring the empire. And also in 1908, he married my grandmother, Mar Rafufia Maria Kukavia Smith. She was from a half Apache and half Yaki Indian family. And um, her father, I believe, must have met my great grandfather because her, her father was a cowboy herself, and they must have met many times. And so that's probably how they met and then married. And yes, you can see there is quite an age difference. There was a 19, age, 19 year age difference between CW and KUKA, but they loved each other dearly. And then in 1910 is when the first, is the first time when my great grandfather first went to Santa Rosa Island, but that time started as a, you know, short trips, you know, from a few days to a week long 
whenever Ann Arvale, Nathan Russellville, would call up um, CW and say, hey, we need help working cattle, or hey, could you, with your captain's license, um, captain the Santa Rosa Island, which was the schooner that's predated the Vicaro one, could you captain that? And so he would, and from 1910 to 1914, he would take, you know, week trips to, week trips to Santa Rosa Island whenever he was called. And well, in 1914, his life changed when the, when the superintendent before CW, Frank Pepper, he moved, he moved from the island in 1914 because his wife shot herself in the big house out of a mental hysteria. He didn't want to be anymore, so he left. And NR was distraught because he didn't know what to do. He needed someone that knew boats and knew cattle really well. Well, he remembered my great grandfather and he went to CW and asked, could you take the job as superintendent of the island? And originally my and originally CW says, I'll take it for a year, but something in him must have changed when he where he just decided to make the island his forever home. And in 1915, he, he decided to sell his ranch in Arizona, leave his job at the Empire and have Kuka move to the island. But she waited until she had my great uncle, Charlie Oscar Smith in 1915. She waited until he was born and then she came. And the moment they lived there, the moment that they moved there, they just loved the island and were very hands-on. My great-grandfather, C.W., ran the ranch like his own. And he loved it. He just loved it. He was the superintendent. He did everything from managing the cowboys, managing the boats, managing the cattle and the horses, and using his powder monkey or dynamiting skills. In 1930, he started constructing the roads on the island. And the first road he constructed is called Smith Highway. In, in homage of him. And he used his dynamite skills to blast the ground of the island to construct the roads. And if you go to the island and you go to Lobo Canyon, which is near Carrington Pasture, and if you look closely, you'll see these holes in the side of the bluff. And that is where my great grandfather would drill the dynamite into the side and then blast the ground. And he constructed most of the roads and the last few he did not construct, the army did when they were stationed on the south side of the island, but that was, uh, but that construction was under his advisement and in the way that he wanted to do. And my great grandmother, she was hands on too. She might have been five, five feet tall. That's it, very small. And in my, and although women at that time were not supposedly supposed to be hands on ranchers and cowboys, she went out at the convention and she loved working on the ranch. She'd help out with the roundups and the managing of the cow whenever she could. Um, she milked the cows, she fed the cowboys. Um, she loved to ride all over the island and she would spoil all the horses, which CW hated terribly. And whenever CW and the crew, the cowboy crew were out uh, somewhere on the open, open, open areas of the island away from the main ranch, my great grandmother Kuka would you know, cook up lunch and pack it away and get a chuck wagon, hook up horses or mules to the chuck wagon and then drive that chuck wagon by herself to wherever they were to deliver them food. And they just loved the ranch. They really made the island their home and they really instilled that in my family's belief and feeling that the island is our home. And in 1947, my great grandfather retired from the position of superintendent after a nasty horse fall and he decided to retire and my great grandparents moved to a house that they owned in Santa Barbara on 630 Anacapa Street. Anacapa Street. It was an old white house. And although CW retired, retired, he never really retired because he might not have been as hands-on or he couldn't ride a horse anymore. He still loved working for the company and working for the island. And he would go down to Port Wainimi and he would um, load the barges or the ships and he would run the ships themselves to himself to and from the island and he never retired he always kept working for the island until he passed away in 1954 it was actually a couple days before he passed away he was down at port wainami which is where cattle were loaded and unloaded from ships he was down there a couple days before he passed away loading barges to then go to the island and the reason why i say barges is because in 1942 the U.S. government took the Vercaro One using the War Powers Act. Congress passed to 
to give them authority to take any privately owned ships they wanted to then use for the war effort. Yeah. And, I, and I included this picture. This is from the Santa Cruz Island Foundation. This is at the original bunkhouse. This is my great grandfather, CW. This is Kuka. This is a ranch hand named Lon Maynard. And this is my grandfather and my great uncle. That's Charlie. That's my grand grandfather, E.K. Smith. And I just want to include that. It was a very cute picture. And this and my great grandparents had children, which they raised on the island. This is my grandfather, Edward King Smith, my great uncle Charlie Oscar Smith, and my great aunt Mary Frances Smith. Charlie was their first son born in 1915 in Arizona. And my great grand my grandfather, E.K. Smith, was their second son born in 1918. He was actually born on the island in the bunkhouse and um, Maria Sierra, which was a wife of a ranch hand, she helped Kuka deliver my grandfather. And then in 1920, um, Kuka also had my great aunt, Mary Frances Smith, but she decided to go to St. Francis Hospital in Santa Barbara, which I can agree is probably most a more comfortable setting other in comparison to the bunkhouse on the island. And all three of these kids were raised on the island. They went to school on the island because next to the saddle barn was a little schoolhouse. And it taught um, not only the Smith kids, but also um, the Lopez kids, which came from a um, family of cowboys that also worked on the island. And that schoolhouse every year had a new teacher. And the Smith kids and Lopez kids went to school there from kindergarten to eighth grade. My grandfather, moved to Santa Barbara in night in the early 30s when he went to high school and he would go to and from the island because the island was still his home. Mary Frances did the same. She went to high school. Both went to high school at Santa Barbara High. Charlie, after eighth grade and after he graduated, graduated the schoolhouse, decided that school was not his forte and decided to really just focus on the ranching. And so CW was really training Charlie to take over, to take over for him when CW wanted to retire. But unfortunately, in 1936, Charlie um, died in a firearms accident. He was at the Halama Ranch, which is near Point Conception, Point Conception in Lompoc, which at that time, Ed Vale, member of the Vale family, was leasing the Halama Ranch with Will Rogers and his brother, Jimmy Rogers. And so Charlie went out there with friends of his and he was cleaning a firearm when they were hunting and shot himself and died. As I said, my grandfather E.K. Smith and Mary Frances Smith went to school at Santa Barbara High School after, um, after graduating the schoolhouse on the island in eight, after eighth grade. And my grandfather's first time on the mainland was until he was the, until he was the age of seven. And, the mainland was a bit of a culture shock because there were so many people and such a new culture and he was just used to such an isolated family, such an isolated home. And he would say that when he went to school at Santa Barbara High, you know, the other kids would pick on him because they considered him like an island boy and different, but he then soon fit in. Both graduated from Santa Barbara High School in the late thirties. My grandfather then went on to become an officer in the US Air Force during World War II and then went into the police force when he returned in 1946 from the South Pacific. And then from the late 40s to 1978 was in the police force, started as a police officer and then worked his way up to Lieutenant Sheriff of Santa Barbara. My aunt Mary Frances went into the intelligence, up into the intelligence industry and worked as an agent in the Central Intelligence Division during post-war World War II, and she was stationed in Berlin and Kyoto and Tokyo. And my grandfather was really the one who kept returning to the island after Frances left for her profession in the government. It's she was not known to return to the island and only, but only in but only for one summer trip in the early 80s. But my grandfather, when he returned, back home after the war, he was out there so many times, even during his police, for, police force time, he was still on the island. When my grandfather C.W. Smith passed away in 1954, uh, my grandfather E.K. took over his job as of unloading and loading cattle from the boats. 
and he kept and he kept that job until the um, ranch closed in 1998. And then in the 1980s, when they were when the hunting on the island, the hunting of elk and deer, became more of a commercial business, he then went into doing the logistics for the island. And he was on the island so many times during a year. Mary Frances only went back one year, which was for a vacation in 1981. No one knows why. Maybe she just wanted a, a life outside the island, but my grandfather just loved it. And I just remember being out there for vacations with him. And when he passed away in 2010, his ashes were buried on Black Mountain, which is a tall mountain covered in oak trees in the center of the island. And then there's also Edward Newhallville. He is the brother of Nathan Russellville. And when Nathan Russellville, as I said earlier, passed away in 1943, Ed Vale took over the head management of the island. And the, the two men, as you can see here, this and our Vale, this is Ed Vale. This is on the pier. This is Betches Beach. This is, there's, you can see the gum trees and this is Betches Bay right here. The two men were quite the opposite. NR was more of a focus and serious man, while Ed was more of a very kinder and more humorous man. Although, he, no matter what he was doing, even if he was working cattle in the dirt, he always wore nice dress pants, a nice coat, and um, shirt and tie, collared shirt and tie. And so, like I said, Edward took over when NR passed away, and he was known as a great cowman with he with a strict manner. His personality was humorous, but when it came to managing the island and the cowboys, he was quite strict. When, if he said something and commanded the cowboys to do something that he said, you must, you should have followed that or else you'd get in great trouble. Um, he was, like I said, very posh man, dressed very well, even when riding horses, even when in the dirt and dust, he always dressed really well. And he is known to use his great social and celebrity connections to really get the hunting business up from the ground. And he knew powerful people like Will Rogers, the well-known actor. He knew um, Earl Warren, which who was governor of California and then became a chief justice for the US Supreme Court. And he also knew Bing Crosby. He used all those great connections by, by um, inviting those men to the island to hunt, which then would gain the attention of newspapers and then that slowly gained attention for the hunting operation. And in 1958, he commissioned the Vaquero II, which was a cattle boat that was to replace the Vaquero I that was lost to the US government in 42, and to also replace the constant renting and leasing of barges from wherever they needed barges to transport cattle to Santa Rosa. And so in 1958, the Vaquero II was built actually in Santa Barbara by Lindell Boat Works. It was made out of wood. And it was actually, as you can see right here, built on Mitchell Terrania Street in Santa Barbara. It was started in 1958 and then completed in 1959. It was operational by the spring of 1959. And as you can see, it is being constructed right here by wood. And then once it was mostly completed, it was then transported by truck and trailer to the Santa Barbara Harbor, there's Stern's Wharf over there. And this is where it was then completed and then put into the water. And it was used from 1958 until 1998. And that is, and this is the boat that my parents remember and my grandfather really um, worked on with the loading and unloading. And what a fun connection because remember in 1843, Manuel Mitch Terrania made Santa Rosa Island as a land grant. And as you can see, the boat was built on Mitchell Terrania Street. I just saw that recently. What a fun, I just think it's a fun connection. And when Ed Vale passed away, he left head management, Ed Vale passed away in 1962. He left head management to Alexander Lennox Vale, who was a nephew of his and was a son of Nathan Russell Vale. And Al was not the only Vale kid to be involved on the island. He had Russ Vale, which was his brother, and he had Margaret Vale. And all were very involved, very much a presence on the island from when they were little kids. And it was, and they remember going up there when they were just so small, when they were at least three or four. And it was at that time when they met 
my grandfather and my great uncle and great aunt and Uncle Lyle and Uncle Russ, which I call them because they became so close to my grandfather. They became like brothers and they, and my grandfather and Al Russ, they became inseparable from the moment they met when they were just young children. And they stayed in contact until um, the two passed away. And Margaret became quite close to my great aunt Frances and they became like best, best gals because most of the time they were the only two girls on the island. So they really bonded over them. In 1962, Al took over head management of the island. He was really hands-on. He was on the island most of the time on the year, um, leading the cowboys and running the cattle operation and during roundup times and when working the cattle at the main ranch, he was always the man that sorted the cattle because it was always his judgment that was called and used when doing business transactions, when sorting and when raising cattle. And so he was always the man that sorted the cattle because he knew what he wanted and what he didn't want. And in 1995, when health matters were taking over his life, my uncle Bill did have to take over for him. But Bill always said that he was never as good as Al when sorting because Al made sorting into such an art. And I love this picture. This is him on Nancy. And he, he had such a way of sorting and working cattle. He was a great cattleman. Russ was involved too, not very much in hands-on way as a cowboy, but he ran the, and was the head man at the Valen Vickers company office, which was in Los Angeles, but then in the 60s, then moved to Padre Street in Santa Barbara. And I never got to meet Al because he passed away before me, but I remember seeing Russ or Uncle Russ. I remember him sitting in the office and he was great. I mean, he did all the accounting and he just ran the office very well. And Margaret, um, she was a shareholder in the business. She might not have been so hands-on, but she was a shareholder and she also made some choices and calls when, in, when, in, um, when the business was being discussed between the three. And she would also go out there every summer with her family and husband to vacation out there and rested as well. And um, yeah. And I want to include this picture. It's actually right behind me to my right side because I just love this picture. It's by Bill Dewey. He's a well-known photographer. And um, this is my grandfather, Edward King Smith or EK. This is Al and this is Russ. This is in the tack room of the saddle barn. Um, the same area in which I showed you earlier, they're, they're, they are, they, here they are at that bench, which I showed you earlier, and here's the saddles. And this is a great place because early in the morning you could sit here and see, oops, and you could see if the boat was coming. And I just love this picture because it just shows how close they were. They really were brothers and all three just loved each other so dearly. Such a pretty picture. And another person is my Uncle Bill, Arnold Dwayne, Bill Wallace. He is a relation on my father's side. He was a brother to my father's mother, who was Lois Jean Wallace. And he, he and my grandmother actually came from a ranching family themselves. The Wallaces were ranchers throughout California and Nevada. And, and during high school, he actually went to high school in Santa Maria in the 1940s. And it was in 48 when he was first employed by Bill and Vickers. He must, I don't know how he got in contact. He must have, there must have been an ad at the time for ranch hands that he must have answered. And so in 1940 is when, the, is the first time when he started working for the island. He entered the island as a ranch hand or a cowboy. And one of the first per people he met was my great grandfather, Charles Wesley Smith and at that time, although CW was retired from the superintendent job, he still taught a lot to Bill, although Bill through his father and mother learned the basics of ranching like the cattle and horses since he grew up in that. CW really taught him how to um, other things in which helped him become a foreman in the future, such as um, managing the payment and the, of the cowboys and managing the cowboys themselves. And my great grandfather also taught my Uncle Bill, how to braid rawhide, which is such an old art. And here he is. This is the kitchen of his house on the island. And this is a pair of reins that he wove by himself with rawhide. And if you don't know, rawhide is the hide of a, a cow and 
how you do that is you would dispose of the cow, you would take the hide off the cow, you would then slice that hide into many small, thin, long strips. You would then wet it and stretch it between two fence posts for a few days. And then from there, you could weave it into whatever you want, such as reins or bridles or quartz, which are little um, whips. And um, this looks like a pair that he made for me when I was little. This is not the exact same pair, but it's quite similar. And in the 1950s, uh, mid 50s, um, Bill first got the position of foreman, which was like superintendent, but we call, but it was known as foreman because Alvale really became a superintendent. But Bill was a right hand man of Al. Like for example, if Al would, um, needed something, he would talk to Bill, and then Bill would then relate that to the cowboys. Because what would happen is when working cattle, Al would be over on some distant hill and overseeing the whole thing. And then he would tell Bill and whatever he needed to say and the Bill would relay that information to the Cowboys. That's how the system worked. And from 1948 to 1999, Bill worked in the island and was foreman most of the time. Occasionally, like three to five years, occasionally throughout that time, just a couple of times, he'd leave the island and then give the position of foreman to someone else during family matters. But most of the time he was foreman and he was out on the island and he was and he said to Hugh Hauser, the well-known California documentarist who did a special on the Santa Rosa Island Ranch in 1996, they told Hugh Hauser that um, he, he only goes to the ranch, to, or he only goes to the ranch two times a year and that was enough. He really loved the island, not so much the mainland and he just loved it. And he did everything from breaking the horses to sorting cattle and branding cattle. He just loved it. And he was also a, Handyman, he could plumb. He could do plumbing if he, if one needed to. He could do mechanic work on cars, and he was also a maintenance man. And he did everything, and he just loved the island very much. And he left in 1999, and then moved with his wife to Chico up north. And my mother and father. This is Karen Frances Smith Healy, the daughter of my grandfather Edward King, Edward King Smith, and this is my father. Peter McEachern Lee Healy, who is the nephew of Bill Healy. Um, they were very involved with the island them, themselves. Um, they came out to them when they were young too. I think my dad's first time on the island was at the age of 12 when my grandmother, Lois Jean, would send him and his siblings out to the island during summer to just get them out of her hair. And my first, and my mom's first time to the island was when she was four or five because my grandfather was just so hands-on and at a young age is when they met each other but they were only friends until when they married in 1990 and both were hands-on um, in 1979 in his senior year of high school my father Peter Hurley was employed as a cowboy or or a full-time ranch hand on the island and did that from 79 to 1986 and worked under um, Uncle Al and Uncle Bill and with the other cowboys and then after that he then did part-time work which was during roundups which there were multiple roundups every year and I mean of course he was out there a lot but that was not um, full-time but he would go out there all the all the time for the roundups and he did that until 98 when the ranch closed in 98 and then his job then turned into become into being the farrier for the horses that were left on the island after the closure of the ranch. And he did that until 2020 when our last horse on the island, Sam, passed away. And uh, yeah. And then my mother, um, Karen Healy, she first got a job as, a, um, as an assistant under Resinel in the office at, in, on Pondre Street in Santa Barbara and that's, that was her first job for the, for the ranch and for the company. She'd work under Alan Russ and soon she was um, helping them with the finances and the accounting and the business and the paperwork and whatnot. And she also helped during the roundups too. And the roundups, which um, many roundups, there were at least eight roundup locations and roundups happened every spring and every summer. My parents would go out there for a few months and just and would work out there and help and were really part of the ranching crew too. And this picture, this is in Arlington Canyon, 
And then this picture of mom is this is China camp, which is you could say the south side of the island. This distant piece of land is San Miguel out in the distance. And I want, and this is a map of the ranch because before I was showing you aerial views of the topography, but this is what the actual ranch looked like with um, fences and roads. This is Smith Highway right here, which is the first road that CW built. And this was the shape of the ranch. And the ranch or San Rosa Island was a cattle ranch. It was a stalker operation, which means it was used for beef cattle, not for breeding cattle. And in the fall, new steers, which were bought from ranches on the mainland, such as in California or in Idaho, they would then be shipped to Port Wainimi, which they were unlo unloaded and then loaded onto the Vaquero 2. And then from Port Wainimi to the main ranch, which is right here, here's the, this is where the pier is, the Vaquero 2 would then unload the cattle and the cattle over the next few days would be sorted and processed and branded and vaccinated. And then they would be dispersed either this way to this hayfield trap or this airport pasture. This is where the airstrip is. And then from there, then they would be dispersed to all of these sections or pastures. This is Carrington pasture. This is Lobo. This is Green pasture named after Green Can. This is Soledad pocket field, Arlington, the left bees in China camp. Southside and La Jolla, the wreck, um, San Agustin and Sierra Pablos and Las Cruces and the main ranch. And the cattle were not rotationally grazed, but the preservation and the cultivation of grass depended on the numbers. So all of the cattle, which at one time could be anywhere from 3,000 to 7,000 head of cattle, they were all distributed to these different sectors or pastures. And the preservation and cultivation of grass was. Um, was based upon how many head of cattle you had in each section. So instead of rotating cattle, which people on the mainland do what my family does today, um, cattle would then be added or shipped away from these sections to then preserve and help um, the growth of the grass and preserve the grass. And so every spring and summer there were roundups. And as you can see, there are different locations. Like this is the Lobo roundup. This is Soledad roundup, Green Canyon roundup, Arlington, Roundup with the Arlington Trap. This is um, China Camp Roundup, Aleppi Roundup, Piedragosa Roundup, and La Jolla and San Cristo and so forth. And every spring and summer, cattle were then rounded up in all these different sectors to these corral sets. And first year cattle were then kept on the range while second year cattle, because on this island, cattle were grazed for two years. Those two year cattle would then be sorted off the first years taken away from that sector of pasture and then sent to the main ranch where they would be weighed and processed and then shipped to the mainland, Port Wainimi and Santa Barbara where they would be sold. And so that was the process of the island. The season of a cattle was two years. They were grazed or you could say double seasoned. And here is the cattle operation, which I just said before. This is the Arlington Roundup. It's over here. This is the main ranch in Pier. This is the Arlington. This is Arlington Canyon. This is the Arlington Roundup. And like I said, all the cattle spring and summer were then rounded up and two year, two year cattle were then sorted off and then um, led back to the main ranch where they would be um, weighed and then shipped to the mainland via the Caro 2. And, and um, cattle, a few head of cows, such as how I say this nicely, not the most nice looking cows, such as cattle that have been injured or were crippled or wouldn't sell well, they would be sent to the Carrington pasture, which is where cattle were kept for the cowboys or for the ranch. And those were then kept for whenever we or the cowboys needed meat. And so every so often, a couple head of cow would be sent to the main ranch where they would be disposed of at the blacksmith's barn and then butchered. So yeah, this is Arlington. This is in 1995. I think this was the last time Al was sorting before his health, matter, health matters got in the way and then Bill took over the sorting. And I want to, here's more pictures. This is at the main ranch. This is um, doctoring of a steer. This right here is Jesus Bracamontes. He was a long time cowboy on the island. He started working in the 50s and then 
um, stopped working in 1998 when the ranch closed. And this is them docking a steer. Um, this is my Uncle Bill vaccinating the steer. This, um, this is um, Jesus's horse, Constantine. And I don't know who that is. I think that's a friend of my dad's. And, but this is Cindy. And then this is actually the schoolhouse. And if you can see right here, this is the original frame of the schoolhouse. And that's what it looked like in the 30s. But my grandfather and his um, group of kids were the last um, graduating class of the island. And so afterwards, the schoolhouse was left empty. And then in the 50s, this extension was put on and then cowboys could live in it. And Jesus and his wife, Virginia, made this their home. And then this is a great picture. This is uh, the Soledad area. This is um, two-year um, steers, which were most likely sorted off at Arlington or Soledad. And this is um, these two-year cattle. This looks like the spring roundup being led back to the main ranch, where then they would be weighed and then shipped off via the care too. And this is my Uncle Bill. He always was, he always led the, tr the trail of cow. He was always at the head. And then the Cowboys were stationed um, throughout the side to keep the cattle in a confined area. And then Uncle Lau, he's probably on some distant hill overseeing and managing. And actually in 1986 is when things started to change for the ranch and for the island. The Park Service um, purchased the island via intimate domain, which is, you could say, constitutionally um, um, argued about. And uh, before that, from the 1930s, they were always, um, the government was trying to get the islands into a national park service, but those bills will always fail. Well, in the 70s, Anacapa Kappa was able to, Anna Kappa Island, a small island off the coast of Santa Cruz Island was made into a national monument. And then from there, the government or the park service was able to use that authority to legally, quotations, legally, um, use intimate domain to then take the island, well, technically purchase, but take. And of course, that was um, that was um, very um, not well taken. And um, Valen Vickers then took the National Park Service to court, which then the court then sided with the national government because the intimate domain use was within the boundaries of the national park. But 1986 is when um, the ownership changed, Valen Vickers' um, property rights were then taken and turned into a lease, but the ranch was able to stay functioning and for the most part, everything stayed the same. Ownership had changed and some rules were being fluctuated here or there, but things were staying the same, but it was in 1998 when the Park Service for some reason just decided to shut down the ranch and get rid of the cattle out of environmental reasons, not um, with if, with evidence not found thoroughly or with great foundation. And of course, Valen Vickers then took the Park Service to court, which I think that went to the Supreme Court. I'm not sure if California Supreme Court or the US Supreme Court, because they were, Valen Vickers was stating it was a break of the lease because the lease was supposed to be um, to allow the ranch to go forth, but the court then sided with the park service and the ranch had to be closed. Like all the cattle had to be taken off and most of the horses had to be taken and sold off too. And so 1998 is when the ranch closed. Oh, I forgot these two more pictures. Um, this is the Vicaro too. This is what it looks like. And this is in 1984. Um, this is in the fall when new cattle, first year cattle were being unloaded. And this is, I think this herd was then bought from a ranch in Idaho. And anyway, they're being unloaded and they're being, they're walking off the pier to the main ranch where they, they would be sorted and vaccinated and branded and then they would be dispersed to the island. And then this picture is at Port Wainimi, which if you don't know is in Ventura. And this is my grandfather, E.K. This is him doing his work, um, unloading two year cattle. You can see how large they became from grazing on the island. This is him on helping unload the boat, which then they would go into corrals at the port and then be loaded onto cattle trucks. And as I said, um, 1998, the ranch did close, but the lease of Valen Vickers was still allowed to stay until 2011. And 2011, the hunting operation was still allowed to operate until that time. Um, 1880s, is when um, the first elk and deer were brought to Santa Rosa Island by Alexander Peter Moore. AP Moore 
brought a cow elk in the fall of 1879 and in 1880 then brought elk and deer. And then in the 20s and 30s, Ann Arbor was then um, sourcing Roosevelt elk from Yellowstone National Park and from the Olympia Peninsula in Washington, and then also sourcing mule deer from the Kaibab Plateau in Arizona. And he was buying, capturing those elk and deer, and then bringing them to the island to um, increase the numbers and bring more genetic diversity. Well, it wasn't until the 40s and 50s when the hunting was becoming a business beforehand. It was just for the family or for the people on the island to hunt whenever they wanted. Well, Ed Vail decided to use, like I said earlier, his celebrity connections to invite friends of his to hunt at the island. And that, of course, increased um, attention and everyone was um, at that time very excited for elk hunting, deer hunting, not so much. But still, the business was more of a private matter rather than a commercial business because it was whenever Edville or Al, after Edville passed away, invited people. But it was in 1979 when uh, multiple use managers, also known as MUM, a well-known hunting management company, came to Vail and Vickers wanting to create a commercial hunting operation. And Vail and Vickers agreed. And so from 1979 until 2011, the elk and deer hunting operation was commercial. Um, there was a limited amount of hunts allowed and hunters anywhere or in all types could come and buy those hunts and then go to the island, hunt elk and deer. But then that was ended in 2011 when legally the Vail Vickers lease was ended and the elk and deer were eradicated. But a five headed deer were able to survive the eradication and the last site or last sign of a deer was in 2014. It's actually in my book, if you have it or you will. There's a picture of a deer print on the road on the south side of the island, and that is the last ever sign of a deer. So in 2011, the management of the island, or the ownership and the lease of the island under the Valen Vickers era came to an end. But my family's time is able to extend until 2020 because my dad was the ferrier for the horses left on the island and my uncle my mother's brother was a an employee or a maintenance man in the, for the national park and we were able to through him get um rent um park service housing on the island and we were still able to go to the island for vacations but the Valen vickers families were not able to because the lease was done and like i said um the horses a few horses were able to stay on the island after 1998. The history of the horse on Santa Rosa Island actually starts in 1844 when Thompson and Jones, under the Korea ownership, brought the first horses, nine head, to the island, most likely of Spanish descent, which descended from the Spanish horses brought to the Spanish, brought by the Spanish in the 1760s. And from 1844, the 1858, the Carrillo-Spanish horses numbers increased from 9 to um, 250 to 300 from more importation or importation of horses to the island and breeding. When the Moors completely bought the island in 1859 and then sold in 1901, they kept the horses that the Carrillos had. And then in 1901, Walter Vale sold off horses that were not as tame and brought Morgan horses, Morgan bred uh, Morgan horses to the island to repopulate. And it was in, 19, in the 1920s to 1940s when the first known stud, because during the Korea and the Moors time, horses were just allowed to breed. They weren't, really, they weren't castrated. But in the 20s, there, um, there was just mares and castrated males, which are known as geldings, and one known stud and the first stud was Mosca. He was a big black Morgan. He was used from the 1920s and the 1940s. And then in the 1940s to the early 50s, a um, big thoroughbred that which was known um, by the people on the island by my family known as Sunshine. He looked like a greyhound. He was very sleek and skinny. And then in the mid 50s is when the first known quarter horse stud was brought to the island. He was a clabber stud. And then after him, until the ranch closed in 1998, there was always a quarter horse stud use. There was a three bars, a seven bars, and a Leo quarter horse stud. And so our horses were very varied 
in blood. They were Spanish, they were Morgan, they were thoroughbred, and they were quarter horse. And um, we had um, 150 horses on the island, um, separating to different groups. The majority were in the Bermuda, which is the working horse herd. And there's anywhere, anywhere from like 50 to 80 horses. And in that Bermuda, there were multiple strings. Each cowboy had a string of four to six horses, which he could use because you do not want to use a horse every day because it is tiring work on the island. So you always had a horse for different areas on the island or to allow another horse to rest. Along with the Bermuda herd, there was also a brood mare and foal herd where the mares and a uh, herd made up of mares and foals, which was at the old ranch. The old ranch is where the mares and foals were kept. There was a herd of weanlings, which is um, yearlings like colts and fillies, anywhere from a year old to three years. Um, um, horses that were weaned from their mothers and then at the age of three, then they were then broken and trained and then put into the Bermuda. And then of course, there was also what we call our senior citizens, our retirees, our old horses, which they made up a herd and they were um, old and they were just allowed to live out their life on the island. Well, whoopsie. Well, it, oh, in 1998, when the ranch was forced to close by the government, all the cattle had to be sold and most of the horses unfortunately had to be taken off. Only 40 were allowed to stay, that 40, um, about eight brood mares, 10 working Bermuda horses, and then the rest were um, elderly horses. And then the rest, unfortunately, we had to take off and sell, which is quite hard for everyone. But my parents kept seven horses and we kept them for ourselves for the, for, as ranching and as pets at our home, at our homes in San Inez. And then Will Woolley, a son of Margaret Vale Woolley, he has a ranch in Templeton. He also took 10 horses himself and kept them at his ranch. And so technically my family, you know, we had the horses we kept, what Willie kept and what the island and the horses that were allowed to stay on the island, but still a majority had to be sold off and that was quite hard. And uh, my dad, Pete Keeley, became farrier for the horses left on the island. And he didn't do much work, like a farrier worker would just be a blacksmithing and putting shoes on. His job was just more simple stuff like um, trimming the hooves and making sure they were in sound behavior. And of course, as years go on, the horses do get older. And I'm, and unfortunately, all the horses all passed with very old age. Most majority of them were able to live to their mid thirties to even 40 years old on the island, which is like 90 years old to 105 years old in horse years. And in 2020, our last horse, Sam, passed away. And that was the last time my family was out there because after that, my family's job out there was done because my dad had no, no more horses to trim. And you know, our time was done. It was cut by that time, yeah. And oh, this picture is um, the Bermuda in 1998. Here is the working horse herd and all these horses then were then split into stri um, strings for the cowboys to use. And then this picture is beautiful because um, here's Santa Cruz and this is what Santa Cruz looks like on a clear day. It's just amazing. And these three, here's Beretta, here's Aspen and Molly's little ears right here. These were the last foals born on the island. They were born in 98. And then this picture was in 90, 99, which was when they were halter, break it, halter broken, you know, trained to the halter and then taken to the mainland. And my family actually kept, my parents and kept Beretta and Raleigh and then Aspen was then sold to um, a girl who wanted to use them for her for rodeos. And um, yeah, all these horses, this is Tina, Funny Face, Bola and Roberta, they all were able to live long on the island. And then Sam, here's Sam, which if you remember, she is that little baby I showed you when I was showing you where the old ranch or the Carrillo's main ranch used to be. That was her with her mother. And she was born in 98. And this is her in um, December 26, 2020 at the age of 34 years old, which is about early the mid nineties for a horse. And this was the last time we were on the island. My dad went out to trim her. And then right after we left that same day, she then went off to the gum trees and passed away. And that was the last time we saw her, but I was just, but you know, I was very happy to met Peace that she was able and the others were able to live such a long life. But unfortunately with her passing, our time in the island in our era was 
closed and that door was shut. Oh, here is Santa Cruz Island. This is the west side. This is the mainland. Galita's over here. Santa Barbara's right behind Santa Cruz. This is Gaviota. This is at the main ranch. The pier would be over here. This is the gum tree line. The barns are over here. And this is the hospital pens. And we call the hospital pens is where you would you know, put livestock or horses there if they were sick to just wash them because they were close to the housing. housing. Or when new cattle came, you would sell them here. And that was my presentation. And I hope you enjoy my book, Santa Rosa Island, A Photographic Panorama. If you don't get it, I do implore you to um, buy it and enjoy it. It is not of the chronological history, which I just showed you, but it shows a visual history of what you would, what you would see today on the island. And if you were back during the ranching era and during my family's time, what you would have seen. But I will say as a spoiler, I am working on a chronology, a book of my family's chronological history. And if you don't have the book, you can get the book at the Santa Barbara Historical Gift Shop, or you can buy the book at my pu my public pu my publisher's online bookstore, Polyverse Publications, known as Lantern Tree Books. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation. <laughs>